Welcome back to The Suzanne Venker Show, where men and women are equal in value, but wildly different by nature. Join us here every week when we challenge the culture's hugely flawed narratives regarding men, women, sex, and love. Today on the show, we're going to talk with Danielle Crittenden, co-host with Christina Hoff Summers of the podcast Femsplainers, and author of a very important book that is just as relevant today as it was when she wrote it 20 years ago. It's called What Our Mothers Didn't Tell Us, Why Happiness Eludes the Modern Woman. But first, a couple of quick announcements. I'd like to remind you to become a Patreon subscriber. There are four very economical levels, and when you sign up, you get all kinds of perks, such as free ebooks, a shout out on the show, and even a Q&A with me, depending on which tier you choose. All you have to do is go to thesuzannebankershow.com and scroll down just a bit until you see the Become a Patron button in the middle of the page. It's that easy. And this week, I'd like to give a shout out to Mary Rodriguez, who is a past coaching client of mine out in California. Thank you so much, Mary, for becoming a patron of The Suzanne Banker Show. I really appreciate it. Also, I want to let you know that due to popular demand, my husband, Bill, will be joining us here once a month for a new segment I'm calling The Bill and Suzanne Hour. He and I are busy organizing topics to discuss, all related to marriage, of course. And if you have something you'd like to request, you can email us at Suzanne at the Suzanne Benker Show dot com. In her book, What Our Mothers Didn't Tell Us, Canadian-American author and journalist Danielle Crittenden examines the foremost issues in women's lives, sex, marriage, motherhood, work, aging, and politics, and argues that a generation of women has been misled, taught to blame men and to pursue independence at all costs. Happiness is obtainable, Crittenden says, but only if women free their minds from outdated feminist attitudes. A longtime contributor to the Huffington Post, Danielle's articles and essays have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Ladies' Home Journal, among others. A former columnist for the New York Post, she has appeared also among others on NBC's Today Show, The O'Reilly Factor, 2020, and Nightline. Danielle is married to David Frum, senior editor at The Atlantic and former speechwriter for George W. Bush. He and Danielle live in D.C. and have three children. Welcome to the show, Danielle. Happy to be here. I'm so excited to talk to you. This is definitely going to be one of my favorite podcasts because it's personal for me in that I read your book, What Our Mothers Didn't Tell Us, in 2000 when it had just come out, I think, the year before or somewhere around, right around there. And I was newly married or remarried, actually, <laughs> um, with my yeah. first expecting my first baby. And that's a perfect time to read this book, isn't it? <laughs> because, yeah, I mean, seriously, you just, it really, abs- is. it really is. I mean, you're just absorbing that like candy for me. Um, and so let me just, just to set that up for people who have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, I've described, of course, the book in the opening, but what I want to do is give people um, a quick overview of the contents because it's very simple to understand. I loved how succinct it all was the way you put this book together. So again, the subtitle is Why Happiness Eludes the Modern Woman, which is also the title of this podcast. And you have it broken up into six chapters with the word about right in front of it. So what our mothers didn't tell us. And then chapter one, about sex. Chapter two, about love, about marriage, about motherhood, about aging, and about the political and the personal. So it's such a clean way of of organizing your book which as someone who's written several books uh, it's always been a struggle for me so there's that part of it and then also it's just Mm -hmm. easy to go right to the chapter that you're most interested in of course at the time I was very interested in all of the above so I as I said ate it up and I'm going to start by reading the actual intro to the book which maybe you haven't heard in a while (laughs) um well, and, and it's also like two decades old, so I'm, I'm like, fingers crossed, it's still going to hold up. <laughs> yeah, I know. And, and not just that. So I want to tell people, again, which I've already said earlier, is this, is this book is just as applicable today, in my opinion, as it was 20 years ago. So when people wonder, like, why are you having this person on who wrote this book 20 years ago? They'll understand when we're finished talking, because as I say, this could just, you could have written it yesterday. Okay, here's the opening. Not long ago, I found myself sitting at a restaurant table with the editors of a glossy women's magazine. They were three ladies in their early to mid-40s wearing power suits and slightly scuffed pumps. They'd brought along blank notepads and slender pencils and were waiting, flatteringly, to jot down my thoughts on the state of modern womanhood. 
Their interest had been piqued by a story I'd written for the Wall Street Journal about magazines like theirs. Women today enjoy unprecedented freedom and opportunity. So why, I'd wondered, were the articles in women's magazines so relentlessly pessimistic? I'd pulled 30 years' worth of back issues of Mademoiselle, Glamour, Vogue, Red Book, Cosmopolitan, and McCall's from the stacks at the Library of Congress. It was partly from reading magazines like these that Betty Friedan had concluded, in 1963, that the women of her generation felt unhappy and stifled. A huge social transformation had taken place between Friedan's day and mine. Had it made women any happier? I wasn't looking to the magazine for a scientific answer, just a general gauge of mood. From that perspective, the answer was, resoundingly, no. In fact, these magazines portrayed my contemporaries as even more miserable and insecure, more thwarted and obsessed with men than the most depressed, volume-popping suburban reader of the 1950s. <laughs> um, you're just an awesome writer. I just want to get that out there. Oh, thank you. I mean, I, I seriously, I read the pages and just thought, oh, I'd love to be able to write this way, but it's, it's never going to happen. I mean, you're just really, really good. That's a little sidebar. Oh, thank you. Well, <laughs> You're welcome. Decades ago. I, I, I <laughs> well, don't know. I haven't done a lot of writing lately. <laughs> <laughs> LL, you can turn that out. Uh, just unbelievable. Okay. <laughs> so here's what struck me about that opening. You probably noticed some years later in 2007 that Myrna Blythe wrote a book called Spin Sisters. And I thought about that when I reread that opening the other day because you were talking about sitting with these women at glossy magazines and how they are selling essentially unhappiness and a completely different narrative than the experiences of the people. And we'll get to this later that you actually were talking to on the street. Is that accurate? Oh, okay. Yes. Yes. I remember. I remember. Yes. I love Myrna Blythe. She was like a leading uh, yeah. women's magazine editor. And just yeah. to tell everyone, she was a former editor of ladies home journal and she went out and wrote this book called right. spin sisters and basically admitted, Hey, I've helped to sell this complete bogus narrative to you. So so when I read reread right. your intro, I thought of that because that came out, you know, some years after you had written this. So I figured right. you must yeah, remember that and be like, yeah, I, I know. <laughs> I wrote about that some years ago. So there's that whole piece of it is just the narrative in the media that is so much in conflict with the lives of real women. And that's really always what's gotten me jazzed up to do what I do is because I'm so I feel so strongly about the culture and its influence on young women and mm -hmm. how it gets into you whether you want it to or not. And you also had another great quote in there that I quoted myself in my work where you wrote something about it had dripped into their unconscious like saline like intravenous solution. Where it yes. Had, yeah. <laughs> All, yes. Yes. Cultural messages of the magazine. Yes. yes. Like even if you didn't want it to get inside of you or you thought you were rejecting it, you, right. you, you couldn't get away from it because it was everywhere. Um, so so that's what I thought of was just how that whole cultural narrative was really just beginning to be exposed by people like yourself and Myrna Blythe. And that was a big thing in that in that year. What do you call it? In the 2000s. Um, where now it's sort of everyday language to talk about media bias or feminist bias or liberal bias, but it wasn't, it wasn't so much then, I don't think. But more specifically as to that whole concept of women's happiness, you also, of course, know that in 2009, the National Bureau of Economic Research came out, of course, with its finding about the paradox of declining female happiness. And that... Um, showed that women 30 years later are decidedly less happy than men, despite all these years of progress. And I think your book is the answer to that, is it speaks as to why that is so. So is there a way you could sort of right. summarize for people, and this is kind of hard, what your ultimate message was from your book? Well, it's interesting. And it's, it's funny, I've been thinking a lot about that book lately, um, I'm, I'm, I'm so thrilled that you still like it and it still has resonance for you and it still has resonance for young women. I mean, as you're quoting, I was researching women's magazines. The internet had not yet gotten really going. And I as evident from the library, library of Congress. Of Congress. <laughs> Actually, I'm quite scandalized. The library of Congress keeps women's magazines like that. But anyway, um, no, so this was all, you know, pre-internet and 
I've my I have two daughters now who uh, one was my youngest was born in 2001. So after that book came out and my other daughter was born in 1991. So she was around nine, I guess, when that book came out. So I was very at the cusp of things, including my own life. Um, with this, I, I think it was a little, honestly, ballsy of me to yes. come out and, you know, presume to give, but th that's what you do when you're younger. You have, you know, you <laughs> presume to know everything. Well, um, you were right, Danielle. In this case, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've, I've wanted to revisit that book, um, not least to look, because it does still have resonance with young women. I do often hear from women who are exactly like you were, young mothers or, or newly wed, and and they're going, what the hell? I have no idea what is going on, what I'm doing, what I'm supposed to do. And so I, you know, I will hear from them that this book helped them. And that just gives me enormous gratification. I think what is different now and then is my message then was in the 90s, and certainly when I came of age, say the mid 80s, I got married quite young by modern, even though mm -hmm. those standards, by any standards since 1965, I got married at age 25. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like a freak. And I suddenly realized I'd been this young feminist in the broadest sense woman. I mean, I worked, it never occurred to me that I even, it's not that I didn't want children, I just didn't think about them. The message I had grown up with and absorbed and from all around me, and, and including those magazines, and, and, and certainly the women's movement that was then coming off the 70s, um, what do we call it, second wave feminism, mm -hmm. where, you know, marriage had been very denigrated, motherhood been, had been denigrated, and if you were a young woman in her 20s, as I was, uh, you didn't think about those things. You thought the most important thing, and again, we're, this is also a, a big class thing, right? We're talking about mm -hmm. educated yep. women. Not that mm -hmm. I was so educated. I didn't go to college, but let's say ambitious mm -hmm. women. Mm -hmm. um, because having aspirations, wanting to do something more is a privilege and Mm -hmm. The American dream is it's supposed to be available for everyone. But of course, with women, it gets very difficult, as we will discover when you have children. So and, and uniquely a female burden. And it remains uniquely a female burden, no matter what you read. But I hadn't thought about any of that, nor had anyone around me and my teachers, advisors. I mean, my own mother was different and I single her out at the beginning of the book. Like she was really wise. So I'm not like dissing her. She was the one who told me marriage was important. She was a one and she worked as a journalist, but she took time off when we were born. But she said having kids was the most wonderful experience of her life. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is not something you heard. Um, and in fact, Everything you, you were never supposed to give your heart to a man. You had, the main thing was to be independent, independent, independent. And anything that um, uh, got in the way of your independence and self sufficiency was bad. So whether it was a man, whether it was a baby, you just wanted to go, go, go in the workforce. And so I, I was lucky to meet someone to whom I'm still married. Um, <laughs> what I did mention years later. Yeah, I did mention at the beginning who, who you're married to. So, um, very, you know, mostly luck, but but very happy. But I, so I got married, and and that was a bit strange, just because my friends, none, of, very few, were getting married. So it was a little weird, and I didn't know what to do about the wedding because it seemed kind of retro to wear a veil. This was very heady feminist times. Mm -hmm. And then um, and then I wasn't even thinking about children, but my husband David's mother was was sick at the time. And I was hesitating having a child. I was 25, 26, thinking I have time, you mm -hmm. know, I'll just put this off. Mm -hmm. And then David, I think I wrote about this in the book, said to me, you know, he was sort of thinking, maybe we should think about having a kid. And I'm like, why? And he said, he said, I don't want to be an old dad. Mm -hmm. 
And that really hit me like lightning. Like, and then I thought about, you know, his mother. I thought, what am I, what am I doing? Why am I sort of thinking I, I can't do this now? All I, I mean, and, and I was in a, an ideal situation because I was a journalist. I was a writer. I, I didn't anymore work for a newspaper, you know, like as a full-time job. So I was pursuing my own writing. So it was, wasn't something that was like going to get in the way theoretically. Um, and then I had our first child. So I would have been 28, I think, 28, 29. Um, and it was like, well, in the book, at one point, I compared it to becoming a prisoner of, under North Korea. You know, like here I had thought I was just like my husband, except female. Mm. I had no mm -hmm. idea mm -hmm. <laughs> Your body has yeah, other ideas yes. for you. <laughs> no, and, and then and then and then your body annexes your brain. That was the oh, other yeah, thing. And I had right. no idea what happened. And I thought, I don't know what I thought. All I know is um suddenly I had this baby, this beautiful girl, and I was like, I was it's like, I remember thinking, I was flipped out. I remember thinking what I was so you you feel and I think this is true of a fa the father too maybe in slightly different ways but you're suddenly overwhelmed by the responsibility mm -hmm. to this new life and I don't mean the do the drudgery the choice I mean you have created the influence this the influence yep and it's little helpless precious self is in your hands. Mm -hmm. and, and I think this is why it was better. And I, I end up concluding that it's better if we do this younger, because just as I was saying, you think you know everything when you're young. You don't overthink it. Like, like yep. people I, just had yep. babies all the time when they were young. They just did came it. like the rainfall. Yeah. It was just right. something you did. You didn't overthink it. But now it's like this big choice. And you have to think <laughs> so. Anyway, I had this baby and I just thought, well, I I had this idle thought like I'd find someone to look after it and continue my work and suddenly first of all I'm not handing this child like what I'm not giving this child like I'm clutching <laughs> this child I don't want to give it to someone else like what am I thinking this is my baby it's my beautiful baby I mean you're overwhelmed yep. with love for the child yep. Also, it's just, I also just felt, I, I remember looking in her little newborn face thinking, I, I never want to let you down. I, I never, mm -hmm. and, and sort of, I never want you to look at me 10 years, 15 years from now and say, you know, you, you hurt me. You screwed you me up or whatever. My life. Yeah. Right. So you were walloped. And, and, in other words, I was walloped. And then I was physically walloped because again, this whole thing, like I'm just the same as men, but mm -hmm. with a, you know, mm -hmm. a woman, mm -hmm. you know, not to be too graphic, but then when the baby cries and your breasts explode, yeah, yeah. like that's not happening to my husband. Right. It's like, right. what is this? Is this right. sonar? Like right. what the, what, why is my body physically at a distance? <laughs> It's like remote control or something technology where you're suddenly in nursing mode. Doesn't matter where you are. You could be in a store. Your body um, has a mind and, of its uh, own. Right. Yeah. Body saying like, and you realize that your whole body has designed you to do this. Mm -hmm. And once it happens, you know, you got to go with the program. So that's the kind of wobbling aspect is until you have a child you cannot really know or understand why men and women end up having such different trajectories, Absolutely. such different priorities. Amen. Amen. And that's, that's what threw me. And that's what became the genesis of this book. Got it. Okay. So tell me how many years you'd been married before, or how many years you'd been a mother, whatever, when you wrote this. I'm curious about so, that. I got married in 1988, and I became a mother in 1991. And that book probably took me, I, I remember I was researching it right after I got married. Um, and then I wrote it when I had two, when my son came two years later, 
And so I was getting up at five in the morning, um, five or six in the morning to get two or three hours in. Yep. And then my husband, like, he's been so great. He was what I really, and I think I write about this in the book, what I was so appreciative of was it wasn't just that he was supportive. And I'm going to say, like, he can be pretty helpless, like many men about, you know, remembering to put mittens on them before they right. go outside and things like that. But he was always, uh, and this is where I appreciate the role of a father versus a mother. I remember him always being supportive of the woman I was before I became a mother. And he, he wants, I mean, very on, you know, early days of marriage, we had very little money, but he always said, and he, at this point he was working full time and I was of course at home, quote unquote, freelancing, which means earning mm -hmm. nothing. Yep. Been there. Done and that. feeling yep. quite self-conscious about that. But you, I, you know, this whole idea, I've got to financially contribute. And he just said, you know, we're going to, we're going to scrape some money together so we can have someone come in two or three hours, whatever it is mm -hmm. a week. Mm -hmm. So you can have this time for yourself. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, but what if I don't write? And like my brain is all firing off on hormones. He says, just go for a coffee. Just do something that gets you out of the house and undisturbed. And, and that's, I think, so much of the wisdom in that book comes from being with him because he was always this advocate. And I think fathers do have this role if they're allowed. Uh, they're, you always say, go, oh, you know, the mother's the one who's always caring about the kid. Yeah, but the father is the one who, who gets you to put the kid, kid down and go out for dinner, you know, and says mm -hmm. the kid won't be murdered or kidnapped. It'll be fine. Like you need that balance Absolutely. in your life. And so he was, he was the one I remember when we were trying to get our first daughter Miranda to bed and, you know, you put her down, she starts to cry and you're trying to get her to that stage where she doesn't cry. And Dr. Spock, whom we were reading, highly recommend early Dr. Spock. He's great. Yep. Uh, said to put an egg timer on, you know, and after, if after five minutes, the baby was still crying, you could go to the yep. baby <laughs> and just say, hi, honey, it's okay. And then you had to leave and yep. then put the egg timer for another five minutes. I remember David physically holding my shoulders in a chair <laughs> while the, the, the to, minutes to get you to not go to get you to not go. Timer. You see, and that's such right. a critical thing. You and I, well, this has been really interesting listening to your whole trajectory because we have very similar yeah. lives. All of that is exactly my story, minus the ever being steeped in any kind of feminist mentality because I have a really different background with the women in my family. But, I, but all the stuff about what happened after you got married and you had your first kid and then you wrote this book and um, how you got it done and. Um, and and then having him do his part to help you do that. All of that is the same as my story as well. And what's interesting is you just highlighted how the nat it is more difficult for a woman to not go get respond to that cry than it is for right. the man, which is why he was holding you. I mean, imagine the reverse, right? <laughs> exactly. He's sitting down and you're holding his shoulders. Just like the image of it does not <laughs> compute, right? I mean, that's just such a brilliant example of the difference between men and women that becomes so pronounced after the baby comes, which goes back to yeah. your point about until you have them, you really don't understand this quote unquote gendered stuff to use the young people's term right. these days, you know, gendered whatever. But okay, I want to get back to some of these things that you wrote in here, because I especially at the part that relates so much to today, because I want to point out how these so many of these themes have not changed. On page um, 23, you wrote, there are a great many women unhappy, because they acted upon wisdom passed along to them by the people they most trusted. These women thought they did everything right, only to have it turn out all wrong that the wisdom they received was faulty, that it was based on false assumptions, is a hard lesson for anyone to learn. But it is a lesson every woman growing up today will have to learn. All that stuff that you described about how the mindset was in, your, in our day, well, in the 90s or whatever, 
it's it's there in spades today in a different way. Mm-hmm. Like it's it's mm-hmm. it's almost more so because well, just for example, so I do coaching, relationship coaching, mm-hmm. and the common theme, I mean, I just had a session yesterday and the woman has built her life, you know, getting, getting degree upon degree. That's what the women in her family did. It was never considered that she would do anything else. She went, she never stopped to think about what she wanted. She just did it. And she is absolutely miserable. She's 28 years old. All she wants to do is get married and have kids. And she doesn't even know where to begin. Those are the women that that makes me cry. That makes me crazy. That makes me nuts. It's the reason why I do what I do, because it doesn't have to be that way. There's a completely different way to construct your life so that you don't end up in that boat, especially when it doesn't jive with what you want, because what other people want or what people tell you you should want is not at all what you should obviously follow. But it's difficult. It's really hard when the people around you are all doing one thing and you feel like you're crazy or something. Well, I also, I'm going to say it's harder now um, because when, and I'm really, and this is one of the reasons I started our podcast, The Fem Splanners, sort of post Me Too was happening, but I realized there was this surging seismic moment again where feminism was being reinvented for the next generation and defined. And I'm, I'm sure you've talked about this on your show, but this Gen Z, which is my youngest daughter, she's 18 and same, same. going mm-hmm. up to the millennial, mm-hmm. my eldest daughter, um, that they are really, really struggling um, with everything. It's, it's, it's not just, I mean, they're, 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 I mean, if, if the women's magazines back in, when I was doing the book were to apply today, I think that would be true. Because the levels of unhappiness in that generation, the levels of suicide, anxiety, I mean, we've all seen it. Mm -hmm. And some trace it to the advent of this Gen Z is the first generation to entirely grow up with a smartphone. So they have never not known the internet. They've never not known social media. And, 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 you know, whatever positive and negative effects that's had. But one of the other things I've been thinking is... In the 90s, we, and I mean I, cohort of women, were absolute beneficiaries of what had been achieved for us in the 70s. I wasn't always seemingly as grateful or appreciative of it as I should have been because, you know, when, you, when it's your turn in that stepping up to the generation, you see all the flaws of the past and you don't. And I remember getting many almost fisticuffs with Betty Friedan for not being grateful enough. But we were also still the beneficiaries of a kind of, I I don't know, I want to call it like a gendered order that even though marriage was being postponed, it was still a goal. Sort of fathers. Oh, I know what you're getting at. Yeah. Still fathers. Yes. You know, like the sex is still, even if they were kind of, at odds at some point, it hadn't quite sunken into full and absolute right. mystif- puzzlement, mystification. And what I, what it really concerns me now, and I, I'm actually thinking of, I've been thinking lately of, of redoing that book or, you know, updating it because it's even if a young woman, I mean, this is the tragedy. When I was writing that book, if a 25, 26, 27-year-old woman said, you know what, I'm going to stop mucking around. I'm going to take dating seriously. I'm not ashamed. I want to meet a guy. I want to get married. You know, put my mind to it. Because uh, one of the things, that, what, the problems was, that, as you said, the women were taught to postpone, and then that gets into its own problems. But she could have found someone and done it. What is weird now is even a serious minded young woman who wants to get married cannot find not just a serious minded young man, but a serious young man, a decade older, like. What do you mean? Sex. A decade older than. It's like, it's like everybody is immature. Everybody. Right. 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 Oh, this is is, is, is like, no one's taking responsibility for any of this. And then I also, I found fascinating about the Gen Z 
stats was that they're also not having sex, despite, you know, right. right. Um, you know, and, and a lot of it, they're just not, men and women are just simply not even connecting. And that is terrifying to me. And when sex, and, and in the modern feminist vernacular now, when sex is spoken about, as we've seen with Me Too, it's so terrible. It's always about power. It's, it's um, you know, right, that like men that are something the 70s to from be feminist. feared. Yes. And, 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 and men fear women. Like, what, if I touch you the wrong way? You're going to, you know, yeah. accuse me of rape. Right. It's a complete mess. It is a complete, complete mess. mess. And, an mess. And I have very sensible daughters and I just hard. I don't know. I don't know what they're going to do. Honestly. I know. I know. So I have a 20 year old who's in, who's in the thick of it and it's to watch her. Uh, go through a daughter? A daughter. Mm-hmm. I have a son who's yeah. 17 and a daughter who's 20. And so she's in the thick of it in college and the the stories i mean i have first hand data here you know just th- this is what it looks like to even attempt to have a relationship right. with the opposite sex and the conclusion is that right. they're just all boys this is hopeless they're just it's just they're i'm just going to have i'm just going to be friends with them until i get out and then i'm going to have to find someone older because the trajectory right. of the male well we know this you know that at, that male adolescence is is um going on and on and and there are reasons for that which we're not going to get into today but um that right. has made it very, very difficult for women. And then, of course, on the men's side, they feel like the women, they're not interested in being serious themselves. To, so to find somebody who is more traditional in scope, you know, in terms of not even traditional, like that's not even right, the right word. It's like like you're saying about right. being vulnerable and just having a connection that the, the people I almost see like it's divided into people who are capable of being vulnerable and want to be and want to have that connection, regardless of marriage aside, just a relationship. And then the ones mm-hmm. that are s- just cut it off at the, at the stop, like right away because of the hookup culture, they just go that way because they don't even allow themselves to feel. Do you know there's a phrase now called in that generation called, have you caught feelings? Have you heard this yet? Oh my God. I just heard it a few <laughs> weeks ago. If you catch oh, feelings, quote unquote it's oh, like yeah. it's oh, like yeah, mom. covid yeah totally <laughs> she's like yeah that's like that means you you know you you like you you feel for the person yeah. the fact that you even have to say it and have a phrase for it to me is so telling because in the past in our days right. you just you didn't need terminology for what was so obvious to the human condition right the, the fact that well, they're trying not to do it and then they they caught it like a disease it's it's frightening well, well, in our day, to sound very old, um, I think what the, the myth and the myth that was being peddled in sort of the culture in the magazines was, um, you're a young woman, you know, you've got the world by the tail, you, your sexual drive is the same as uh-huh. men's, you can go out, you uh-huh. can sleep with everybody uh-huh. you want, just seize the day, um, have numbers of uh-huh. fun, dead adventures, and then eventually you'll settle down. And then what I was writing in in the about sex thing was like, that doesn't work really well for women on many levels, not least whatever they're told. It remains true that women seek something more emotional out of sex yep. and want relationships, but even if they have to pretend otherwise. Um, and, but, but what it did for men, and this is the sexual revolution, is it freed men I think that's why we have sort of toddlers yep. posing as 28 year olds. Absolutely. They, they, it freed them of all responsibility. Yep. So when a young man wanted sex, it was the woman and, you know, for better or worse was behind a series of electric fences mm-hmm. and <laughs> he was not allowed. You access, know, we know people access. did stuff. Right, right. Yes. Right. But, but, but you were not, unless you were willing to step up, get a job, you know, prove that you could support her. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you were not going to get that regular level of sex with no. someone you loved. Absolutely. And so there are good reasons for, you know, cutting, you know, changing that yep. or whatever. I'm a big but proponent of it, it Daniel. <laughs> men, men have no reason. There's no, in no. a way we've sucked purpose from them too. And, um, and, as I discovered when I had this baby, you know, we, we talk about family friendly workplaces and things. 
you just, it remains true. I think the statistics I used in the book then, I, I check them, you know, occasionally and they remain true, that most women, if they had the economic ability, would stay home with their children. They do not find, and when you think about it, yep. most women are not in glamorous careers. Most women nope. are cashiers. Yep. You know, if they had the economic ability to stay home, not forever, but yep. when their children are small, they would do it. And, um, and they can't. And it used to be true that cashiers could stay home with their kids too. You know, that, that, that for, and we, again, we don't have to go into this, but, but that agreement, that bond between men and women is gone. And, um, I, it is and men are falling behind for many reasons and women are now unhappy and, and they just, it, it's like watching two magnets, you know, with the yeah. opposite yep. magnet the opposite, when they just bounce off each other. That's, that's what it seems like right now. It's like they're traveling in parallel, you know, like thinking they're the same and just being roommates or friends or what have you. And, this whole concept. Well, or you talk, worse, just be perplexed. Well, about how it works, you mean? Yeah, just like, what am I supposed to do? if I? Oh, here was the thing I was going to say. What I, I, and this is to your point about what your daughter has seen in college. I am only just found out, I, I was watching um, this love affair where the girl sleeps with him before they even talk. Oh, and don't I get me started. my daughter... <laughs> No, no, but no, when I went to her, I said, um, is it true that you would sleep with a person? Not her. I mean, yes, obviously, right, theoretically. Right, her generation. You right. would sleep with a person before you would have a coffee. And my daughter said, yes, a coffee is way too intimate. <laughs> what? So we have to, let's like- stop right there because that, that goes back to what we were saying a second ago about vulnerability and connection. I mean, you're talking about, and that's, right. that's what you were saying about the difference between our generation and the, so much has happened in the last 20 years to completely cut people off at the, at the their hearts are closed and the sex is just, it's just sex. There's just like, it, there's nothing right. to it. Anybody can do that. It's, joyless. You know, the, it's yeah. this, the connection is what's absolutely missing from this generation. And that's a perfect example, even though I hope that's not the quote unquote norm, it wouldn't raise eyebrows. Let's put it that way. In our day, it would have, you would have looked at that person like they were crazy. But today it's just, yeah, there are people who they, they honestly believe that there are some women who just enjoy that. And then other women don't. And I don't agree with that. I don't believe anybody likes to be used. I, I, I reject that outright. No, um, they I, don't. Even the girls uh, watching through high school, the girls who, who put themselves in that position as, as you know, is, is that 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 type goes back a long way. And in the end, yep. it's they are being used. They are being used by 16 year old boys are not going to get into you know, a responsible relationship um, or very few, I should no. say. But um, yeah, no. And, and then I found out also that choking is a thing. Oh, I mean, a lot of this is coming from porn and the, yeah. I, I, I mean, I, you, there are statistics that porn, its influences is, is, you know, not as bad or great as everybody thinks, but certainly the dynamics of porn influence sex lives of teenagers. And I think this is why a lot of women, young women won't venture into sexual relationships because it does become these hookups at parties where they are forced or expected to do sex acts on the boys. And that's the hookup. There's no pleasure for her. There's no, no right, right, right. You're just servicing them. You're, it's, it's a, you're being a prostitute. I mean, of a porn yes. Stuff. Right. Yeah. And, and, but that's, but they think that that's what you do. And including down to, I just, I just discovered, this, I must be the most naive person on the planet. But I didn't know that choking was a thing. Like, yeah, choking, as I, in, I know what you're you making out with mm-hmm. someone. Mm-hmm. And, and it's supposed to give you a high be because you like, yeah, because you um, I wonder why young women don't want sex. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I want to get back from? to okay. Yeah, no, well, we yeah, let's move sorry, away from sorry, that sorry. for a second. That's okay because I have so many <laughs> other things I want to get to here. So I'm going to skip to this story that you wrote about a modern man and woman. I'm just going to read this because I think this again. You could have written this yesterday, and I think this happens even today. Well, 
definitely today. You wrote, I once had a conversation with a man in his late 30s who had just become a father. This man viewed himself as a compassionate, politically liberal male. I'd known him to constantly champion the unfortunate against the privileged. He was deeply concerned about the potentially harsh effects of welfare reform, particularly on single mothers. Whenever he spoke about his wife, who was, like him, a book editor for a New York publishing firm, it was always respectfully and with admiration for her talent at her job. But one day he found himself absolutely startled by her behavior. (laughs) They had lived together for five years, he told me. Both of them absorbed in their interesting careers. Then one day the woman, a previously reliable feminist, burst out. If you don't let me have a baby right away, I'm leaving. I don't care if you marry me. I just want a baby. Well, he married her right away, and they had the baby. She thought she would go back to her job, but once their child was born, she decided she didn't want to. That was all fine with him, of course, but, he said, betraying a slight flash of resentment. Things were now pretty tight, and he felt a pressure on him to succeed that he hadn't before. His job, by New York standards, did not pay well and would probably never pay well. Their apartment was too small, there would be school bills, etc., and he was constantly racked with worry about how he was going to pay for it all. I realized as he poured out a story that it had never even occurred to him that he might have to provide someday for someone else. Yeah. And those are the stories yeah. that are so prevalent today that were really, even in our day, unheard of. Because even though we'd moved away from the strict breadwinner homemaker model ourselves, it was still understood that men and women are vastly different. And it was understood that at some point yeah. you're going to jump out of the workforce. So you need an employed uh, guy. You know, you can't just marry someone who has, you know, majored in music and is going nowhere or whatever. I shouldn't say that because, of course, some people do well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but you know what I mean? You just you, you look for um, someone who, who was going to be able to provide. And so that is no longer even to, to compare our children's generation from ours. It's not even in their frame of thought. Like they don't, I know people who, I work with people who, well, yeah, I thought, you know, he was sort of doing this, but I thought he would get on this track. And lo lo and behold, years later, they're the primary breadwinners and they're absolutely miserable and their husbands never found their way. And that's a whole nother separate conversation. But point being that that no one told them how it works after the babies come and how different men and women are and how those just bank on that so that you can make choices early on. So you don't end up in that boat. Right. And that's what, and I was, I remember being embarrassed that I suddenly, to the degree I was contributing at all, could no longer contribute. What I also found weird. And I think I wrote about at the time was how being an at home mother in some circles became a rich status. In other words, like, Especially like in New York, you know, you'd have a very successful Wall Street guy or something. And he'd married some very successful woman. And she had been at the time would have been a large salary, raking in two or 300 K a year. And then she quits and has the baby. And and I I remember like the man would sort of preen, like it's like he had this racehorse in the stable, you know, like I could have kept her racing, but we can afford, you know, we can still have the second home, private jet. We don't need her salary as big as it was. I'm happy that she can stay home. And that's like creepy too. Like why should, (laughs) well, an educated being at home be a status, you know? And, and yeah, that's that's like a whole separate possible. No, but it's the same idea that somehow, no, I mean separate because it's such a small men and women aren't, segment of the population no but it's it's this idea that this is not understanding and I, I i don't think i understood i think these women didn't and still don't again partly because we weren't expected to that when you have a child sounds like ele- el- you know elementary your life changes yeah. but also you change and this idea that you need someone who's going to provide for you even for let's three five months, years yeah right know, right is is has not occurred to them either of them and and that's you know that's sad and bizarre and it's a lack of courage in my opinion because uh, on the parts of the parents so i blame the parents by the way for all of this i don't blame i mean the culture absolutely but when you know you have a culture that's instilling the wrong 
messages with your kids, you you have a responsibility to counteract that. They may reject I can tell it. Tell my daughter. But, yes, they get it, but you know, that they're going to find a guy who's going to agree to this is the whole other problem. I know, you know, I know. That's why all the parents have to do this simultaneously. It's very simple. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, the, the, the the mother, the parents of boys as well as women. Oh, absolutely. That's, maybe it's what we're really oh, talking absolutely. about teaching men that they're going to have to step up at some point. Um, so I want to read one last thing that I think sort of encapsulates. Oh, I really like it because you're talking about marriage here. And then I'm going to do something a little different, Danielle. I normally go from here and I sign off with you and then I do the email of the day and on my, yeah. own, on my own, but I'm going to do the email of the day with you because, Oh, I love email. I love, yeah, I love hearing from listeners. Because it's complete. I chose one that is completely relevant to our conversation. So I just thought I'd have both of us discuss it together. Or you can answer it on your own, even if you want. Okay, but first I want to read this last paragraph from your book. All but the happiest marriages are held together for reasons. Because husbands and wives seek different supporting roles within marriage. Because they rely upon each other for different things. And marriages are held together even more by opinion the opinion of society that marriage is good and laudable, that separation is a calamity and a failure, and by the opinion of the husband and wife themselves that only the gravest incompatibility can justify divorce. But we have, step by step, weakened these reasons and discarded these opinions. I think that really sums up what has happened in the last several decades when it comes to marriage, and by extension, Uh, the relationship between women and men because when that cultural beliefs I guess you'd say when they fall away or when they change people tend to go with them right and so if we don't support that as a culture it's just really difficult um, for people to um, stick with what they know to be good or right they just want to be they want to feel part of, well, you know, they want to be, what's the word? Uh, um, well, it's also, and I think I write about this in the About Marriage chapter, it's just as we are surprised and don't have expectations or understanding about what it's going to mean to be parents, we we don't have real instruction about how to be married. And one of the things early on, I forget where I read this or who said it, Somebody said to us, there's you, there's him, there's your children, and then there's the marriage. And the marriage is its own thing, separate from all of you. And it is the primary thing. That if the marriage is not, if something is wrong in the marriage, you have to fix that. Because if something is wrong in the marriage, everything is wrong. It affects the kids. Absolutely. It affects you as an individual. And learning to think of the marriage as something that you both nurture and protect was very, very helpful to me. Because what I think I see a lot today is even when people are, do get married and, you know, and they're having kids and they seem happy, but they let themselves be sub- subsumed by their parental role, you know, yes, let yes. themselves be overrun by their children or they, they they think too much about them the the aggrievements of as the wife yes or the aggrievements of the husband and you forget that the most critical thing that is going to make it work out is that you both think of the marriage agreed one hundred percent selflessly and separately I I think of it as a difference between being married and on a daily basis and giving into your feelings on any given day which change like the wind and Mm -hmm. cannot be counted on and you should never make decisions based on your feelings you should use it based on the way you think right and when you have that value in mind that you just said and my husband and I are the exact same way when the marriage is take the the belief in that unit um is takes precedence it completely colors all your decisions like you don't you don't get caught up in the feeling so much or at least if you mm-hmm. do, you're able to put them away and think of this bigger thing. But if you don't both think right. about this bigger thing in the same way, you're going to always struggle with those feelings that change week to week. So, right. yeah, um, I think that's a really good, a really good point. OK, well, I could talk to you forever. I have a thousand more things, so maybe you can come back. <laughs> <laughs> it's lovely. I'm, I'm so flattered. Thank you. OK, good. So let's get to this last thing. 
This is the email of the day. It's from a woman named Christine. When you got married, things were perfect. You were both in love and life was good. Then somewhere along the line, everything changed. She changed, or maybe he did. Either which way, now your relationship feels, well, hard. I coach husbands and wives who feel lonely, disrespected, or misunderstood in their relationship. So many women today are desperate for their husbands to step up to the plate, to make a decision and to stick to it, to lead rather than to follow. Ladies, you have the power to make it happen. Men respond best to women who are grounded in their feminine core. As for husbands, so many of them want their wives to stop nagging and to just trust them, to smile more and to complain less, to look at them the way they did when they were first dating. Men, you have the power to make it happen. Women respond best to men who are grounded in their masculine core. The secret to lasting love rests in the masculine feminine dance. Once you master it, your relationship will no longer be difficult. You'll be moving with the biological tide rather than against it. And that makes marriage smooth sailing. If you're struggling in your relationship, if you feel frustrated or alone, I can help. Just go to SuzanneVenker.com, that's S-U-Z-A-N-N-E-V-E-N-K-E-R.com, and click on the coaching button at the top. Don't wait another minute to acquire the mindset you need to find love and to sustain it. It's so much easier than you think. That's SuzanneVenker.com. This is the email of the day. It's from a woman named Christine, and she writes, Hi, Suzanne. You responded to a post on your Facebook page saying that women did not enter the workforce out of necessity. The mad rush of wives and mothers out of the home and into the workforce was a political move, not an economic one. That's something I wrote she was writing back. I agree. I was discussing this topic with my 36-year-old daughter. She's married and stay-at-home mom of three And she made the comment that women could not have been happy with their role in life at that time because if they were, the feminist movement would never have happened. If women were content with their lives, why did so many leave home to go to work? I would like to hear your thoughts and explanation on this topic. So let me just preface this by saying, so she's just, you know, repeating back to me what I've written that 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 whole you know, flux of women into the workforce in the 70s was a political move. It was a social and political move. It was not an economic one. We now have an economic problem, for sure. But that in terms of people being able to do that because of all these other decisions that they've made. But at the time, it was it was a very dramatic political push. And her question is, if I guess what she's basically asking is, well, weren't all the women miserable? Otherwise, why would they have done it? I agree there was a huge political push, but I also believe the political push came from reality. Remembering that the women's movement and Betty Friedan was a very middle class, upper middle class movement. Um, It wasn't, you know, the honeymooners. It wasn't work. It wasn't. The working, working class. class. Mm-hmm. I mean, these women, not to say that they didn't have the same feelings, but these were women who had had the ability. And remember, the post-war America was weird in that sense. It was unprecedented. It was understandable that this whole idea that women, you could have this whole class of women who did just stayed home. I mean, women before the war at all levels, even those who were economically able not to have to take a job, still were very involved in their communities, Mm -hmm. contributed in many, many ways, some worked. But what was, I think, strange about the post-war time is they, of course, had gone through this horrific trauma that was the war. Um, People were happy to be home. They were happy to get married. And then we had all these new suburbs, right? That was a new phenomenon where you, you go off into a house, and, and here's the other secret. Women of that class before the war had help. They had, even my lower middle class grandmother yep. 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 had a, a weekly Same cleaning Same lady. Same here, yep. And, and post-war, we had all these miracle machines. You didn't need that help. And you're isolated. Now you're not near your family. You're in these, these new fabulous suburbs. And you're at home. And as we saw, you know, there was a lot of casual sexism. There was sexism against women. Yep. So take a woman who has a, a, an educated woman who has a degree, stick her in a suburb, tell her she should enjoy doing the laundry with her fabulous new machine. And she's going to blow her brains out. Um, there was a lot of drinking, you know, and I think, I think that was the rebellion that maybe for the first time 
women had the opportunity to say, you know, no, I'm sorry. I'm not going to be parked in this suburb. I, I want to be part of the world. I want to be, I am smart enough to be a lawyer. I don't have to just be the lawyer's wife. So I think there was a real legitimate push. It was certainly politics and ideology at the core of it. But I think that's why Betty Friedan resonated so much. It's, she, she, I mean, even though she called the suburban house, the you know, the comfortable concentration camp. She, she liked men. She liked marriage. She liked children. She liked motherhood. But she also, um, I think, struck a chord among many, many women who were similar to her who just said, you know, that's it. He's asking for his dinner. I'm throwing down my, mm-hmm. you know, dish rag and walking out. So I think it was a, co- I mean, he couldn't have had something that explosive that was just quote unquote imposed by a movement. Um, but then the repercussions had to all be worked out. And I think when we were talking about at the beginning of the podcast, we were still both beneficiaries, but also having to work out the consequences of those women who 20 years before us had had stormed out the door. So I don't disagree with any, anything that you've said, although I have a slightly different take on it in that I think there's no question that there were women who felt um, constrained and that there was that malaise and there was that time period that needed to be ironed out between, okay, I got here, but where am I going to go going forward now that, My kids are all in school and I've done that hard work or whatever. Right. The the problem is, in my opinion, that it was it was the way it was done. Right. So like if you really look at that book, it it was very political in nature, the feminine mystique. And we've known, of course, we know the background of Betty Friedan. And so the person sort of the person flying that flag, so to speak, is not exactly somebody you'd want to look up to. Um, aside from her Marxist background, she also had a horrible relationship, very destructive, physically abusive with her husband on both sides. And she was clearly right. miserable. I mean, she just was. So right. my, my argument is that misery loves company. So instead of looking at this time period where, like, everything you just said happened with the war and then, and then things were comfortable and then sort of like, okay, now what? Instead of sort of calling a spade a spade, it was magnified to be something much, much, much bigger than it actually was. And that that took root and just sort of took on a life of its own. So yes while- and no, I mean, I think there, it, it was great for ambitious women. I know a lot of women who were not Betty Friedan's who did have successful marriages, but were very happy. I mean, who were early journalists, you know, my mother was a journalist being told that she couldn't write about certain topics because she was a woman. Like there was a lot of that going around too, you know? So here's my background. And so this is, this might give you a little yeah. in into why I feel the way I do. My mom um, has an MBA, had an MBA. She's, she's gone now from Radcliffe in the 1950s. She became a stockbroker. She was in a male dominated field. She was one of the first stockbrokers. She was there for about 10, 15 years before she quit to stay home with my sister and me. By that time she was... 38. So she did things sort of, yeah. quote unquote, backwards, she yeah. liked to, she liked to say for yeah. her day. Um, and she definitely faced sexism. But when she did, she handled it, you know, without going out and sort of, you know, starting a whole movement over it and like, you know, trying to change right. society. She changed her own circumstances and found a position with a company that, well, OK, so if this guy was that way, I'm going to go find somebody with a different guy who's not that way. And of course, and she did. And they were happy to have her. And she did very well there. So I guess what I'm trying to say is there's sort of two ways to skin a cat. And I just feel like right. that other way is right. very, very negative, And it takes on a life of its own. And it and it sort of ca- it sort of brings people into your cause who are very bereft and upset and it's just that's not the way in my opinion to to get them up and out it's not empowering i guess i totally agree that that just saying what they said and 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 giving voice to that certainly allowed women who didn't feel like in time in in uh, tune with the times who wanted more i think it gave them a voice absolutely and a, and a way to to say hey in the same way that you have women now who are like i just want to get married Can, is that okay to say it was the reverse back then yeah. so i completely get that well i think th- i think there's a real corollary trying to pronounce that right with today and the me too movement i think that's why i got so re-engaged because i'd stopped writing or talking about these issues for a while and it's 
the problem with movements is you it's like lighting a fire you don't always have control of where that fire is going to burn or or go and usually the the people that keep blowing wind on it are the the people who are most invested in mm-hmm. seeing it go a certain way because most of us don't have time for movements right. as oscar wilde <laughs> said the problem with socialism there are too many meetings and um <laughs> And with the Me Too movement, what what the spark that is legitimate, which I th- which I found, and I think we probably all found very exciting, was, you know, that there are a lot of there is a lot of mistreatment of women in the workforce. There are these way that 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 it it cottoned on to something very subtle but real, and especially for young women, the way they are treated. Um, I felt that was a very empowering and important thing. But as we have seen, it it can be taken to a point where you can make accusations against someone and they're out of a job before there's any hearing. There's no due process, et cetera, et cetera. So we're, I think what we're going through now is probably maybe felt similar to what yeah, it was probably. like in 1973 mm-hmm. and four um, of watching something that had was tr- latching on to feelings that were true circumstances that were true, but then gets yeah. its second wind yeah. or keeps being empowered by other forces with more Agreed. ideological agendas. Agreed. Whatever. So um, yeah, I think, no, I think, I think that's very, very true. Um Oh my gosh, Danielle, this has been so great. Like I said, I could, I could have you on for several more shows to cover everything. I really appreciate your joining us today. Well, thank you. I'm just, I'm just thrilled, thrilled to be on. And I'm, I'm, I'm really, I, I love, I love talking about the book because I haven't talked about it in a I'm long sure. time. I've, I've, I've forgotten what's in it. <laughs> well, I haven't. And so it's just all coming back to me. So just to recap for people, it's called what our mothers didn't tell us why happiness eludes the modern women, woman, excuse me. And even though it was written Back in the day, back in the day, I can't believe 20 years ago is back in the day. Um, yeah. it, it really is just as relevant today. So I highly recommend picking up a copy. And um, again, you're, you're an awesome writer and it's just an honor to speak with you. Thank so you I so much. really appreciate your coming on. I want to say real quickly about what you're doing right now. I know and I've told people ahead of time that you're, you'd have the podcasting with Christina Hoff Summers, who I had on a few weeks ago. So is there something you wanted to say yeah. about how people can... Find yeah, that. well, we, we she is now retiring from the podcast, but it's <gasps> called is? the Femsplainers. Okay, yeah, we it's 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 um, but we have we it's me and then an awesome panel of interesting, fascinating I women. I saw that Caitlin talking Poynigan. over these very not just this but all kinds of issues and um, and yes, and you can find it on any podcast platform. Fem. It's called the Femsplainers. The, the Femsplainers. The Femsplainers. The Femsplainers. Awesome. Okay, yeah. Danielle, this has been great. Hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you, Susan. I appreciate Thank you. it so much. Thank you. And that ends this hour of the Suzanne Banker Show. Don't forget to tune in next week when we talk with Bettina Arndt, an Australian writer and commentator who specializes in sex and gender issues. She has a fascinating background and lots of stories to tell about her run-ins with the media. Finally, don't forget to continue the conversation on Facebook. Just type in The Suzanne Venker Show in the Facebook search bar and you'll find it. Also, please recommend this podcast to one friend you think would enjoy it. And don't forget to leave us a review on whatever platform you're now using. Finally, if you have a question or comment for me, you can email me at Suzanne at the Suzanne Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a great week.